I'm going to do a poem, and uh, when I wrote this poem, it was because I was, I, I was a former professional athlete, yeah. I hung out with a lot of athletes. I'm also a jug and alcohol, yeah. alcohol counselor. Oh, wow. You so, were. Both sides of the I didn't know that. <laughs> That's news to everybody. You learn something every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I know my cousins <laughs> laugh at me because I said, man, let's go smoke one. They said, you were uh, drug and alcohol. <laughs> so what? I don't want to be relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it, and, and I wrote this poem. Actually, I wrote it up here in Austin. We were staying at the hotel up on 35, mm -hmm. um, the Red Roof. And I was sitting, and I was looking out the window, and I seen all, all night long just running up and down. So I sit up here and wrote this. And it's called Mr. C. They call me Mr. C, but you can call me Coke. Traveling from parties and clubs, as comedians tell a little joke. Now that I have made lots of scumbags rich, few have been murdered and thrown in the ditch. More valuable than diamonds and precious gold. Just use me just once and you will be sold. A schoolboy will forget about his books. The beauty queen forgets how she looks. Turn a renowned speaker into a bore. A mother of six will become a whore. Take a school teacher and make her forget how to teach. A powerful preacher will forget how to preach. Your rent money will spend, you, you, your rent money you spend, but not on your rent. Then fall down on your knees to pray and repent. Out of control, you rob, steal, and kill. Under the white powder, you will have no will. Remember, my friend, you can call me Mr. C. Now you're trying to figure out if you want to be free. Actors, politicians, they are our hero. Now their bank account has turned into zero. Now that you know me, what will you do? You will have to decide, it's all up to you. Listen to me, and please listen well. When you ride with cocaine, you are headed to hell. Woo! A new F word for him. Floxed, a drug warning. My ear, my ear hurts so bad, Doc. Take this Levaquin for three days. It hurts. Levaquin did not stop the pain. Here, take Floxed for five days. It'll stop the pain, cure the infection, and make you right again. But don't lift anything heavy. It can cause ruptured tendons. The pain in my ear, it hasn't, it hasn't gone away. But I didn't lift anything. Let's try Cipro drops in your ear. The pain stopped. Now I don't want, now I just want to die. I'm so depressed. Can't get motivated. The headaches. Here, take this antidepressant for 60 days and come back and see me. <coughs> and also go see a therapist. The dizziness, falling for no reason. Use a cane. Get some exercise. Lose some weight. I can't even think about getting off the couch. Get rid of your couch. <laughs> falling, breaking bones, surgeries to repair those broken bones. Headaches, like nothing I've ever felt. It feels like acid pouring down my head, <clears throat> off my head and down my back. Are you still taking the antidepressants? Good, here are more prescriptions. One will calm those active, overactive nerves in your head, and the other will support the first antidepressant. Take all three and see me in 30 days. Debilitating headaches, unexplained falling, but are you depressed? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not suicidal. Just sad, empty. I can't concentrate. A lot of absent-mindedness. I used to love to read, but I can't even get through a text message now. Stay the course and see me in three weeks, three months. Finally, Providence intervened. A chance phone call. An old friend. 
who was lamenting the exact same issues. She said to me, Helen, check your meds. See if you took fluoroquinolone, fluoroquinolone antibiotics, fluoroquinolone antibiotics. That's Cipro, Leviquin, Avalox, Bloxin, and so much more. If you, if you did take these, you've been floxed. I took them. I took three of them. I'm not going crazy. My body isn't giving up on me. My mind can be re revived, I hope. I've been floxed. <laughs> Moving forward, taking control, researching, arming myself with information, and never, ever taking medication on a doctor's recommendation without first researching it. <coughs> In, 19, uh, in, 2016, in 2016, the FDA safety review warned that fluoroquinolone, will, when used systemically, like with tablets, capsules, and injectables, are associated with debilitating and disabling and potentially permanent serious side effects that can occur together. Not just one side effect, but several that can all occur. Uh, act concurrently. These side effects can involve tendons, muscles, joints, nerves, central nervous system, and cause depression. In my research, I discovered that the myelin sheaths of the nerves could be damaged or possibly <coughs> destroyed. Some people have no negative side effects, yet many experience nerve damage. This manifests itself as a needles and pins sensation, uh, in my, and in my experience, that burning sensation from my head down. Floxyhope.com offers information and resources. For me, the frequency has lessened, as has the intensity, thanks to time, nutrition, exercise, and a great acupuncturist. I kept the couch against my doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Will I ever completely be cured of this thing? Will my damaged nerves repair themselves and my body feel totally healed? I can't answer those questions, but I can warn you. Don't take fluoroquilin lens. Don't get floxed. Yay! I'll just do I'll just do it in this one. It's about my, my, my addiction. I have an addiction I find, occupying my mind, thinking about it every day, often letting it have its way, let it roll, let it take its toll, come what may, as its way. I'm in its power for many an hour, and it gives me a chance to give opinion and voice, say without care what others never dare, and my thoughts fly when I'm on a high. The drug that grips me, He's yeah. Yeah. And now a couple of samples of the drug. I actually cut this shot last night. Um, get, get them all together. Next place I need, needed to be was the full English with Tom for poetry and tea, followed by another poetry mix. An event that runs from midnight to six. And driving downtown, a noise made me frown. And the warning light saying the tired pressure was down. Hopes of keeping the same car for the tour had yet seemed in vain. It seemed the car, higher curse, had struck again. <laughs> Tea and poetry. <laughs> yeah, that was a, it's, it's not all David's fault. Oh. I took the Mickey after me loads of money, so that phone down and he says, How long is your car going to last? Mm -hmm. So don't tell David anything disastrous because look what curse on you. <laughs> <laughs> It's called the Curse of the Franklins. Anyway, a tea and poetry events begun. My first one from last year about what I hope will be next year's tour once more poets for reunited, but it was not to be. Sadly, Bob couldn't make it. So, like in 2016, we were poets three. For those of you I'm referring to Bob, Bob Wood. Uh, once again, it's a shame he can't be here. I wish he was. 11 to midnight, poetry and tea, followed by poetry mix from midnight to six. And so it began. And it was no mistake, there was no break. Both events merged as one. But I wouldn't be staying. 
I'll be leaving, leaving early at Freens. My car gets me to my motel and runs like a <coughs> Later, I can take it back and hopefully find out what's wrong. Hopefully not to run up too soon, so I can get to the remaining events later this afternoon. And that was it on the way back to the motel this morning. Took the car back to chase for another, another one in the range. They said, would you like an SUV? I said, no, bloody pants. That's too big for me. Just something simple that starts with a key. One was found, to which I was bound. But it wouldn't do. I turned the key and the notice said, serviced you. No good if on service day I'm hundreds of miles away, as is my style coming hundreds of miles and more on my annual Texas poetry tour. The next one I turned the key, somewhat tense. Everything was okay. So I drove away thinking, okay, let the poetry commence. And my, la my life may well be a bless, may well be a blast, if this time David doesn't say, how long will this one last? <laughs> <laughs> Melbourne books outside, I've just had lunch. I relax and smile at the poetry, ain't gonna start for a while. Of the break, make the best. Put the seat back and rest. Weather's getting warmer. I'm drowsing, may take some rousing. Need to wake up, give my body a shake up. Then I'm in Marvin Books, Marvin Books, it's composing time. And once more, I capture more moments of my touring one. The Lion and Pilot at Marvin Books are, well, you bet. Best variety I've heard yet. Now we've got Austin Writer's Roulette. The stage we're on, photos done. Now, let's get it on. Thank you. Okay, um, so the thing I'm about to read, the book that I've read from previously, um, I'm planning on, hopefully when I finish it, making it into what's called a hypertext. So that means it's going to be kind of like Wikipedia, where you can click on different things. So the next thing I'm going to read are two different hyperlinks that are kind of in the middle of the story that you can click on and then it goes to this kind of non-functional <coughs> section. Um, and the hyperlink is the word itself hyperlink. So, yeah. so what's, what is it about this hyperlink stuff? Like most writers, I'm going to figure this out as I go, but it could be helpful at the beginning anyway to develop a rhetorical understanding of the structure that I'm using, even just to get an etymological understanding of these words. So let me define my ter terms, both of these terms, if I can. Hyper. Hyper is an informal adjective meaning hyperactive or unusually energetic, overexcited, overstimulated, keyed seriously or obsessively concerned, fanatical, rabid. Hyperactive also means unusually active, of children, displaying exaggerated physical activity, sometimes associated with neurological, psychological causes. Um, hyperactive can also refer to hyperkinetic behavior. Um, uh, this comes from the Greek uh, representing hyper, with, and there's like a little um, dash of the E, meaning over, above. Um, hyper as a prefix means above, over, or in excess. Um, shall we skip some of these? Um, even just providing, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to miss this. Um, its origins and popular use, use as an independent phrase first occurred in the 70s, but it can also be used as a noun, meaning a person who promotes or publicizes events and people, especially one who uses flamboyant or questionable methods. Promoter, publicist, um, even just providing this definition of hyper the noun alone seems simple enough of an explanation for why I would choose to structure things in this way. I mean, come on, isn't a promoter of events and people that much more capturing of a festival? Though there may be many more reasons that will become clear later. Link. Link as a word or pre prefix has many more definitions. It may just um, be helpful to list them here. One of the rings or separate pieces of which a chain is composed. Anything serving to connect one part of a thing with another. A bond or tie. A unit in a communication system. Any of a series of sausages in a chain. Ha! A cuff link, a ring, a loop, or the like. An object, text, or graphic link through hypertext. Um, and I'll come back to hypertext in a second, because that's one you can also click on. Um, when hyper and link are joined, you have an idea of excessive connections, maybe even obsessive connections above and beyond the norm. Isn't this what novels are meant to instill in readers in the first place? 
Wouldn't this be the purpose of a hyperlink to create excessive connections between ideas? Would this not fit into the setting of a festival, addictions abounding, the purpose of which is to celebrate and promote events and people a hyper of ideas? And then um, to go back to hypertext, which is something you can click on. I'm assuming if you're already here that you've already pounded through the definitions of both hyper and link and have clicked on the hypertext hyperlink to get to where you are now, which means I can move past hyper and define for you the next word, text. This is going to be easy, let me tell you. Nothing anxiety-inducing or nerve-crunching about having to define the word text. So here we go. Let's do this. The author heaves in a breath through his concave chest, wipes his brow, punches his buttocks, and continues. Text. The main body of matter in a manuscript, book, or newspaper as distinguished from notes, appendices, headings, and illustrations, the original words of an author or speaker as opposed to a translation, paraphrase, commentary, or the like, the actual wording of anything written or printed, any of the various forms in which writing exists, the wording adopted by an editor as representing the original words of an author. Don't worry, though, I haven't forgotten my liberal arts education. <laughs> it's important to remind you, dear reader, that everything is a text. Every goddamn thing, whether it's printed in words, spoken out loud, drawn, babbled by a drooling and incoherent madman, or farted from the tight enclosure of an asshole into this wonderful world. All thought is text, all streaming words and images are text and capital letters on billboards and subway stations on the side of a truck barreling down the highway, printed on the edge of a car seat, mangled expressions of a leather doused with paint as his girlfriend for the last time kisses him, and he turns away from her disgusted with himself at all his fragments and mistakes, the blaring sound of bass and electronics booming from the amplifier at the edge of a festival, all is text, text is boundless and infinite. And all language can do is approximate what's really going on, can limit, can fragment, can temporarily brush up against all that limitless awareness, all those falling trees in the forest with absolutely not a single person to hear them. This, like all things, is an attempt to wrestle with this text for a while. To wrestle with that human need to haunt and reflect, to consume and defecate, should be pretty fun, all things considered, but time will tell whether the author succeeds at reaching a conclusion about this or not. But wait, there's more. This still fails to answer the question of why hypertext, and for good reason. There's almost too many reasons to mention here, but an important point to make, while I still have your attention, if I in fact do, is that hypertext is like a festival itself. It leads in all sorts of directions, dead ends, escapes, red herrings, revelations, and epiphanies. It helps the reader become not just a participant, but also a character, a full-on mover or hyper of the story. What we have now in our contemporary period is the freedom to choose who and what we want to be, which self we want to indulge, which image we want to protect, project. Hypertext is just another projected image, another form of self-expression not yet mastered. It's there waiting to be unleashed. You are the author, the writer, and reader. Hypertext is time, is the past, present, and future interconnected and leaping back in on itself. Hypertext is the tarot. It is what all of us, both the author and yourself, are looking for. Connection. El Guapo. No, <laughs> <laughs> two little tiny ones here, they go together. I wrote them about the same person. <clears throat> of pins and needles. They say the pen is mightier than the sword, but the needle trumps them both. It cuts your soul with each prick and it writes a horrible story in your blood. He comes to her and she calls him friend. He is really nothing of the sort. Rich and spoiled, he just doesn't like to get high alone. The pain of being alone and lonely, having lost all she could call worth having. Daughter, son, mother, father, family, and friends. She jumps on the H train to nowhere and loses the feelings that tie her down. She's a poet of sorts, but like everything in her life, it's only temporary. Stinging bliss, bringing slurred speed, stumbling, the mockery of life. She tries to text on a dead phone to somehow reach out to others who cannot be reached. She floats along helpless in the wake of sad and maddening, maddening choices. How did this angel get brought so low? Wings clipped, sun dipped, tight lips. She cries out in wordless agony, selling parts of herself for scraps. The tracks, they go on forever. The H train has no station, it's just imagination. People jump off and own no ticket but the needle of a prick. It takes her away from her world of pain, but all too soon it drops her air off again. Amidst her pain, eyes divert, feeling hurt, she feels like she's let me down. Mumbled lies like railroad ties, she tries to hide with no disguise. I see where the tracks end, opioid rush, soul crushed, the train will wreck. Helpless, hopeless, self-created victim of a pinprick destiny. That's the point.
chemistry lesson. Lighter held against spoon's wide flaring bottom, flame licking up to heat, soot, black and silver colored tiny mixing bowl. Bubbles form and the reaction is set off, soon to be sucked from a fine cotton's filter, an abhorrent mixture. Hands so shaky at the start, forced to control. Soon the mind embroiled, just a little pinch. Prepare yourself for flight, sit back and travel. Eight balloons should last the night. The work of the day done, money found and spent, not for fun. This is the other side of, of the fun house, where there are no laughs. This is the gritty side, where you learn to excel at math. Twenty at a time, building a little stack. Frantic phone calls to find out where it's at. Meet up and trade the day. A proper slave to this unending play. It's just maintenance, sickness held at bay. The price unimaginably grown in many, many ways. It was recreational at one time. A, a visitor that came to stay. Whole life rearranged, new ideology, old goals changed. Life cut up into moments held in stark relief. This spoon, lighter, and lovely mixture, a certain white thief. Welcomed into a world to escape the world you had, now chained by the freedoms you thought you bought. That old life, not so bad. The escapes we seek are sometimes just jumping out of pans into fires, jumping onto train cars looking for Shangri-La, selling our souls and sanity for chemistry's chain reaction promises. She worked in the front office, and she was helping me. Her Spanish was fast, and I only understood every third word. This was my introduction to Bolivian coca. Altitude sickness is caused by a lack of oxygen in the bloodstream. The thin air and lower air pressure at higher altitudes makes it difficult for our lungs to absorb enough oxygen. The result is a throbbing headache, a churning stomach, and shaky legs. It took days they'd be, but so brittle that it was easy to strip the leaves off the center stem. I'd seen the men on the street, a bulge in their lower cheek, teeth stained green, and knew it was coca. It took hours to get that masticated nugget of half-dissolved leaves, but I got there. Only then did the therapeutic effects of the leaf begin, the buzz. Coca no es cocaína, but the leaves contain a tiny bit of the psychoactive al alkaline that makes the white stuff so popular. The indigenous people of the Andes had been growing, chewing, and praying with coca leaves forever before the Spaniards came. But those Spanish bastards made sure every, coca mi every miner had coca. It, it took the edge off the hours, days, lifetimes spent deep inside the earth, digging out glittering minerals. That alkaloid numbs the mouth and deadens the appetite, but keeps a person buzzing along for hours. Evo Morales, the first indigenous president of Bolivia, was an Aymara coca farmer. He led cocaleros in a protest against the US efforts to eradicate the coca plant. One colonizer encouraged coca's use, and the other did what they could to kill it. My third introduction to coca was to the byproduct. Mounds of the stuff could be purchased for less than ten, for less than a hundred dollars. At a party, I was handed a mirror with several lines neatly arranged across it. We were in the Central Valley, only a day's drive from where the plants were grown and processed. I'd met Americans and Europeans who had moved to Bolivia for the stuff. They stayed high all the time for a fraction of what it would have cost in the Western world. They seemed to have forgotten it was illegal. I never did. My cousins who revolved in and out of jail back in California kept me from forgetting. But sitting there, slightly buzzed from the beer, 
and the adventure, I decided not to pass up this opportunity. Wow. I felt like Wonder Woman after she spins around and is standing there radiating power and beauty in her tiny star-spangled bustier. For someone who always felt like she was doing everything wrong, relationships, my job, my life, this was a revelation. I was suddenly the smartest, sexiest, most confident version of me that ever existed. But none of them were good enough. I was convinced that every single guy in the room wanted to get into my giant baggy pants, but none of them were good enough. The coat clicked with me in a way smoking pot never had. I wanted to feel this way every day. And then I remembered who I was. Anything that made me feel this good instantly could not be trusted. I loved the way it made me feel, but I knew that it was bad news. I had to walk away. I could never become acclimatized to this. Thank you. Thank you. want to smoke? I don't think so. Why would I want to inhale that junk so it can rot my body, slowly causing me humongous hospital bills years later, or cost me the money I don't have? No need to support the cigarette company nor the hospitals. Hell, they don't need my pathetic little habit. They have my best friend and her friend and her friend's friend. In fact, they help the whole world. Never mind the small print that says this product causes cancer. Who reads fine print anymore? Poor fools. How about real drugs? Real drugs? Like, why would I want that? I've got something better and it's cheaper. It's called the shopping bug. And I'm loving it. Every store has my number. They know what I like, except I'm retired. So can't do the credit thing, so I do the window thing. Hmm. Something my mother taught me years ago. A way to buy things without really buying anything. It's called window shopping. A way to pretend I was participating in the American dream. Only now I can do it over the computer. Don't even have to leave the comfort of my home. Thank God for mothers. Any more drugs you want me to try? How about Facebook? Shit. I knew you would ask me that one. I hate Facebook. And no, I'm not a Facebook junkie, but I know lots who are. Spilling their empty thoughts in a sentence or two, selling themselves short, thinking they are communicating, that they are making connections, hell, maybe they are, but I don't think so. The Russians are now proud owners of Americans' Facebook information, millions. Use this against us in our own elections, which many Americans are still denying. They just love their Trump. Maybe I will just bury my head in my books coming out every so often like a turtle to see if it's safe. Yet, if not, return to the library for another book letting the years flow by. I like this drug of choice. It involves no money, just my time, which I have plenty of. I am retired. Hell, forgot I had already mentioned it. Oh, well. And did I also mention I'm very smart? OK, you haven't asked me about guns yet. Am I hooked on them? Are they my drug of choice? Hell no. In my world, there would be no guns. In my world, the police wouldn't be shooting unarmed black men. In my world, Trump wouldn't be president. The NRA wouldn't be making a profit on fear. People, when are you going to wake up? Guns never made anyone safe, and there must be a better way to keep our population down. Mm. How about politics? Is this your drug of choice? Not mine. I'm only trying to get people to vote, to encourage people to feel their God-given power. And finally, I would love to get on Twitter and tweet in big, bold type, Mr. Trump, President, you're fired. <laughs> little by little, my drugs are disappearing until my only drug of choice is me. <laughs> this one's called Sydney Again. Happy birthday. I stand before you, my hand tracing the lines on your face naked. I clothes swept away like sands of our times making room for new thoughts and experience, a different way of communicating. Yesterday we passed a painting in a gallery of two people facing each other, lips to lips, toes to toes, 
standing on a line circle, unbroken, not touching the ground, no beginning, no end. My hand continues its sweep downwards, letting my light in, sending memories of 46 years together, bursting through, no beginning, no end. Naked, our life force is burning within us, just waiting for permission to explode, sending bits of us into other galaxies, seeding other lifetimes and memories. No beginning, no end. Stroke my cheek, I whisper, and so you do, sending your smell throughout me. I inhale it deeply again, reminding me of your love for me and a desire to create a safe environment for us. No beginning, no end. And I'm broken, so. mm. This one is called Just a Just a Little Old White Girl. Mm -hmm. So you think I'm just a little old white girl? Guess again. I've been every race, every color, every religion, both male and female, human and not. I have lived in every place from the mountains to the seas. I've been the ruler and the slave, a wise woman, a poor fool, traveled through time, sat at the feet of great men and women. Dance with just about every kind of life you can imagine and more. So don't think you can ship me with your lies like our government wants to take care of us. Bullshit. They have their own agenda and it doesn't include you nor me. So wiser people. Look in the mirror each morning and repeat after me. I am strong and powerful. It only takes a minute. Then stand back, but hold on tight for the greatest word of your life. Trump's tweets will only make you laugh. His presence will be like a fly buzzing in your ear, just an annoyance, something to be tolerated like a child who hasn't learned his lessons yet. His time is soon to be over. But in the meantime, don't underestimate him. So are you still thinking I'm just a little old white girl trying to seduce you with my words? Well, you're right. So here's another white lie. We need our fucking guns. It's us against them. Close the borders or else they will get us. Those immigrants who used to be your immigrants are now fearing the new wave of immigrants. Shout Black Lives Matter into every cop who passes your way. Sign if you choose, the universe hears it all. Who really needs guns? The NRA for profit and Trump who thrives on fear and division. Okay, so I'm not just a little old white girl. Well then, who am I and who are you? Good you <laughs> I was going to address prehistoric, <laughs> but uh, I decided to put something on. Uh, so, mayhem, huh? Hmm. The bright spot. Following sunset arises. Starlight star, bright cyan on pig, dusk gray guitar, stirring wanting day in night translucence, wax polished full moon, music candescence. Two in one love melody, melting mellow, campfire cracking in the background yellow, spiraling flame passion in horizontal position, light stroking intertwined in friction ignition, full moon shivering a drip rippling stream. I like twelve songbirds serenade moonbeams. Love couplet, rhythmic, symmetric, symmetric pulse fluidity, inflecting every syllable to reach climax lucidity where love's shooting stars hits the right spot. Please do not shout. Time fades at your songbird song does fast. We're in thunder call, storm less intense. Train tracks wear to mute loud locomotives as the wind whistles, gets sound dampened. Tuning wand around a retired veteran's head that endured the firing ranges, lawnmower and music. Factory machine man manufacturing loss that drowns our, our adolescent ears over the years. A tuned vet receiving the finest stereo receiver with Bluetooth sensitive hand free technology. One can tune in a volume with surround sound, hearing a paper crumple or hear feet scraping steps. Ring a ding and ling, tune of an incoming call. Please do not shout anymore. I can hear you. 
Never knew you, you sounded like this before. Now, right ear volume up, left ear volume down. Now I can turn you off with the left hand motion. Upon an earpiece, push button demotion. While I can turn you up with a right hand motion. Upon a right earpiece, push button promotion. Tell the truth, the scariest part of this darn contraption is to hear your own voice squawk in this squeak adaption. Violins. Shadow wet words, swallow bottles, drifting downhill. Once recorded, wander yellow, tattered, and torn. Where on high perches they will gravitate, gravitate down river to ride tides of time, abrasion being seawater worn. Some break into shards while others float with the shards. Some seek moisture to sink deep into, into fathoms depth that ride evolving millenniums. Revolving continuous arcs, some find seashore stages to be value evaluated in depth. Upon snow, melting cold waters, spring forth trailing words, photo by a message among floodwaters, rushing out to sea, see where wandering expressions end up virtual, virtual venture, when open cast spells upon a future vision, seashores, vital lines. Thank you. R.G. Hook. That almost sounds like a cheer, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm four. So this is, uh, was at the end of a 10,000 mile road trip around the United States, which started out of Texas and went to the East Coast, through Michigan, the Dakotas, over into California. And um, <clears throat> I was uh, dreading coming back, because quite frankly, it was really nice to be on sabbatical. So. Egyptian, Egyptian mythology says that if we follow the direction of the sun, we will heal our heart. I first learned this in Michigan, the halfway point of the driving around the United States road trip. I knew heading east out of Texas, then west, was the right choice, but I didn't know why until then. I do not have to tell you that I miss you, or even how it still manifests itself each day. You watched as I jumped off that pendulum of emotions, dying in love, anguish and hope fear and excitement, ready to live again despite your absence. That pattern of feelings waged battle after battle, and it's only now that I can see how you never left my side, not even a little. You were the only one who knew just how broken I really was when I set out over a year ago, and you've been the only one who has understood how I've struggled to let go. Starting over felt like agreeing to forget, so I came here to Miramar Beach, the end of where I meant to begin, to say goodbye once more to you and to my still wounded self, to the regret I still hold in my heart, superseded only by what I learned from loving you. You know how I dream, and two nights ago I had another one. I was driving a Jeep, not your burgundy color, but a light feminine gold. There really wasn't enough room for all the people I'd offered to give a ride, but that didn't stop me from continuing to invite more and more people to hop into the truck. As each new person's weight settled in the floor of the Jeep, and it dropped closer and closer to the ground, I ignored it, pretended I wasn't worried that I might break down, blindly driving in spite of the too heavy load. The next scene was the same group of people, but now we were returning from wherever it was that we'd come, again with too much weight. Because I was the driver and the last one to get in, I could see clearly how this excessive bulk could permanently damage the truck. In fact, I don't know how it didn't damage it on the way to the first location. But I didn't want to ask anyone to wait behind since I had encouraged them to come along. It wasn't far into the trip when I felt the tire go flat. I stopped so people could get out of the Jeep to fix it. And that's when I saw that it wasn't one flat tire, but that all four were deflated. I'd been driving on three flat tires when the last wheel gave out. After everything was fixed, after all four tires were inflated once again, everyone started to climb back in, each person's weight once again putting too much pressure on the frame. I was standing outside of the vehicle, shaking my head. I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but if I didn't speak up, I risked permanently damaging not only the frame of the wheels, but the entire structure of the Jeep. 
<clears throat> in the last scene, I arrived at a house, and I saw a man who was familiar, and knew that if I were willing to feign interest, I wouldn't have to continue being alone. Out loud, I said, I could close my eyes and pretend it was you, because even in my dream state, you were still dead. I did close my eyes, and when I finally woke in the light of reality, I was shaking my head no. You have my love forever, which did not end with your death, but today and always I promise these things, to let go, to never settle, to finish. Some people are addicted to emotions, and, and some people will never finish their grief. But uh, we were talking before about the, the archaeology of festivals, and most of my drug education came from being with musicians, right? So um, our band was performing, uh, you may never have heard Roy Harper, but Roy Harper, uh, hats off to Harper, Pink Floyd did that song. Anyway, Roy Harper was a son of a, a, a contemporary musician, and he was big in the 60s. So I was his support in a, a hippie festival in Ohio uh, called Strange Days. Strange Days was based upon another hippie band called Hawkwind. Hawkwind used to do solstice uh, free festivals on, on, uh, on Stonehenge, right? This is hippie shit. But uh, the point is, that was where I got my drug education because I watched Roy Harper. Uh, I've done my poetry. He was supposed to come out, and he couldn't come out because he had blood coming out of his nose. Okay, and that was cocaine, right? Uh, I worked with a band in California called Bliss Nitty, Fools for Joy, and um, the chief guy who's still performing, uh, Victor Mang, they were sort of Grateful Dead type clone. California loves that sort of stuff. And um, uh, we used to do the New Year's Eve coming in with poetry and music uh, in the hills around uh, somewhere. Uh, but the point was, he'd do a day job uh, of phone calling people to sell things on ketamine. Right? I, I didn't know what that drug was, but it's some sort of tranquilizer that calms people down. He was a very, very, a, a person of alacrity. And then he'd uh, take different drugs at night. Uh, the link to literature and fantasy is the fact that uh, Peter Carey, who won the Booker Prize for the True History of the Kelly Gang, uh, and was nominated for the Booker Prize several times, uh, used to uh, be in an advertising agency in Sydney where he would take cocaine to be able to survive, then he'd go up to the hippie area in Mullumbimby uh, and uh, have weekends on um, marijuana. Okay, Nimbin, Mullumbimby, all that area was sort of like the hippie area. Um, different drugs have different geocentric spaces, right? Places where you go uh, to use. Like the band I worked with, the Gong, they were based on an LSD power vision in the 60s which uh, said that there shall be a gong, and the gong shall be a universal. And even when the people died, uh, there was David Allen and Jilly Smythe, who just both passed last year. Um, they based it on uh, Robert Graves, the uh, white goddess. Uh, she was one of his white goddesses. Okay, now this is no fantasy. This is the way they lived their life. Now, they, it was a thoroughly saturated drug lifestyle. But uh, the point was the making of projected fantasies through music. And, uh, and they also have books out, the story of Gong and that, which is the idea of a vibration that pretty soon we're coming into an earth change in 2032 where people will be able to see what they call octave doctors as people in music who are working to align the frequencies of music with the earth because our musical scales are out of sync. Anyway, this is all, this is all projected fantasies, but it has to do with the linking of the world through drugs into fantasy and into literature, into what we're doing. And I agree with Trevor that our drug may be poetry and expression and gathering and meetups, but it's just a beginning of consciousness and community. You see, you start off on your, on your marijuana and your ecstasy and your gateway drugs like work, addiction, <coughs> grieving, emotion, whatever it may be, but eventually you end up saying, there's more. And this is more, and that's why we're here.